So I'll try to talk a little bit about passing through PCI devices to a guest and why we need to do that, right? So I will talk a little bit about virtualization concepts and PCI devices. I really want to pass through very quickly uh, on this. Uh, this is not, you know, this is just for reference. These slides will be available afterwards. And then we can uh, go more deep on uh, pass through itself. OK, so uh, layers. I mean, everybody, I mean, computer science and engineering in general, uh, we love layers, right? I mean, we create layers and abstractions to isolate, to make the things more secure, to, to abstract details, right? To hide details. We don't want to see uh, what the other parts of the system are doing. We don't want to be interfered uh, fr about, uh, from, from them. Um, as Eduardo said yesterday, I mean, he talked a little bit about abstractions as well, and he put a, a he pinpointed a phrase from Joe Spolsky saying that every time you create an abstraction, something will leak to the other layer, right? Uh, and that's not the only problem, right? I mean, when, create, when we create layers, uh, there are other impacts as well. So there are impacts in performance. Every time you create a layer or an abstraction, there will be impacts in performance. They can be minor, like, you know, I don't know, I mean, loading a shared library. That's not a huge impact, maybe. But, you know, we have so many of them today that the impact uh, sometimes is quite huge, especially when we go, you know, into uh, the more, uh, I mean, the bigger layers that we have here, I mean, the, the, the bigger abstractions like, you know, virtual machines, virtual clouds that we have today. So you have so many layers that this can start to impact your performance. Uh, so virtualization is just one of these layers, right? Um, you know, there are many examples of uh, virtualization. We are going to talk specifically about machine virtualization, right? And uh, so when we are talking about machine virtualization, right, we have to run a hardware uh, exact, that exactly behaves as the hardware you are virtualizing, right? In the example, I mean, in this presentation specifically, we are talking about virtualizing machines uh, that are Ex uh, 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 an exact copy of the host hardware, right? Because we, we want to accelerate uh, the maximum possible. I mean, if you are trying to run a uh, power processor, an IBM power processor on x86, uh, you have to emulate the instructions, you have to emulate the processor. If you want to run an ARM simulator, you have to emulate the processor or the whole environment, actually, right? But when you want to, you know, performance, when you are in a cloud environment, for instance, you probably want speed. And in this case, we will want to virtualize the same hardware we have in the host because with that, we can leverage some characteristics of the hard hardware and improve the performance, right? Uh, and in this specific presentation, we are talking about KVM and QMU just because, uh, no, this is uh, the de facto standard today in the industry uh, to do virtualization in this kind of environment, right? So what makes a computer, right? Usually, you know, a computer is just a machine that access memory and something is returned or processed uh, on that memory position and you put the, the, the data back in the memory, right? It's just about exchanging of data and changing the data. Uh, so what changes the data is usually the processor, right? And then you have the memory, of course. But then you have to put memory in the system and extract memory from, uh, extract, sorry, you have to put data in the system and extract data from the system. And we do that through IO devices. So when you virtualize a machine, you have to virtualize all this, these three parts, right? And usually, I mean, as good engineers and computer scientists, I mean, in the beginning, we tried to accelerate what was uh, impacting most, the performance, right? And what usually impacts most the performance is the processor, right? Because if you had to emulate each instruction, uh, the execution will be very slow. So the first thing that uh, gained support in, in the hardware was uh, CPU virtualization, right? So you can execute your instructions directly in the host processor, right? And this is that way today. Uh, today, we also have a bunch of uh, features to do memory virtualization directly in the hardware as well, right? So the guest usually does not have to, I mean, sorry, the host usually does not have to emulate a memory management unit. So there is support in the processor to, so that the guest can use the memory management unit from the processor itself directly, 
without interference from the host, right? Uh, I/O devices is a little bit more tricky because, you know, first thing, I mean, when I was at school, at least when I was under an undergraduation, uh, I learned that I/O is always slow, right? So it was not really a concern. I mean, if it's slow, why should I care, right? Uh, so let's see a little bit about how the I/O devices evolved through the years, right? I mean, back when the PC was created. I/O was really slow, probably, right? We have the ISA uh, bus. Probably the majority of uh, the guys here never heard about ISA, right? <laughs> uh, so this was uh, the first uh, bus standard for the PCs, uh, and it was quite slow. It was so slow that when we started to have uh, SVGAs monitors back then, I don't know, in the 80s, probably, uh, the bus was not sufficient to uh, throw all the data that we needed in that you know, uh, monitor with uh, 1K per 7, 6, 8 pixels, right? <laughs> uh, so they created different buses, speci specifically the VESA local bus was specifically created for these to connect monitors with better resolutions, right? And then we started to have a bunch of different standards because you know, people wanted more throughput and it was not available, right? So then, uh, the industry created a standard, PCI, the old PCI standard, right? Uh, and we will see that I usually say PCI and PCI Express, which is the newest standard that everybody uses uh, interchangeably, although they are not really the same. Um, and when PCI was created, um, you know, everybody started to use PCI. It was sufficient, go sufficiently good for the, the, the needs that we had at the time, right? Uh, however, when they started to migrate, I mean, to use PCI buses in servers, they had to extend the, 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 the standard. So they created PCI-X because they needed more throughput, more devices, right? In a PC, you usually have, you know, a few devices. And in a server, you can have tens of devices, right? But then again, you know, that was not sufficient because we started to have GPUs and graphic cards to, for gaming, for instance. And they, then the industry created AGP, which was a bus specifically targeted for that because they needed more data to, to go through uh, the bus. They needed more uh, lower latency, latency, right? So then again, they took the next step and created PCI Express. And PCI Express is the uh, de facto standard for today. And we have many generations of PCI Express because they are trying to improve the buses in order to provide more speed and lower latency, oh, sorry, more bandwidth and lower latency, right, for the devices. However, you know, it seems that the industry does not, doesn't think this is sufficient again. And we are having a bunch of new uh, buses being created, uh, the majority of them proprietary, such as NVLink and NVLink2 from NVIDIA. Some of them, like OpenCAPI, they are open standards. Uh, there is uh, PCI Gen X, I think, and there are some other standards being uh, studied and created. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, if you take a look on the bandwidth that will be available in the next PCI generation and the bandwidth that we have in these uh, other buses, there is a huge gap. So something will probably happen. So, but today, this is the standard and we have some devices there, right, which is kind of complicating a little bit the, the life of someone that you know, wants to exploit uh, the devices, but that's where we are, right? So when we are talking about PCI pass-through, uh, as I said before, I mean, PCI is a tentative to standardize uh, the buses in the industry, right? The, the type of devices that we connect to the computers. So uh, as this is a standard and everybody uses it or everybody supports that, uh, of course, that someone trying to use a virtual machine will want to exploit this, right? Because, well, I said the I.O. is slow, but when we are talking about, you know, four gigabytes per lane, and you have some devices that use 16 lanes, so this is 64 gigabytes per device, right? So we have network cards reaching 200 gigabits per second today. So. This is, no, this, is, this is a huge amount of data, right? Even some processors, they, they are not able to process all this data when they have a burst. So, uh, of course, uh, now I can log in. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, we are in the moment in which 
I/O started to be a concern. So when you are using virtual machines, right, you want to have something better than emulation because now you have an amount of data that an emulation layer will not be able to handle properly, right? And then we start to think about how to use these devices directly in the virtual machine, right? Because that way uh, you would be able to leverage the speed of the bus directly without having to have any layers in the middle, right? Not only that happened, but I mean, if you take a look on the hardware itself, I mean, the majority of the hardware in the past, they used to have I.O. bridges in the middle that uh, used to translate you know, internal buses to PCI. But today, if you take a look on the most recent processors from all the vendors, the PCI controller is inside the chip already because they need more speed. I mean, if, otherwise, they are not able to handle the, all the data that uh, is coming from the PCI uh, buses. Right? So the solution on the from the virtualization side was to try to leverage these technologies inside of VM directly without having an extra layer, which would be the emulation or even the host system uh, in the middle of the process, right? So in QMU, uh, we have a way to define a device when creating a virtual machine. And uh, we have many types of device. So we have, of course, emulated device. So in x86, you can even uh, emulate floppy disks, although I don't think Linux will support them for long. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, one very common uh, thing that we emulate is uh, EA1000 networks. So this is an Intel network card, and we, we, uh, a bunch of people emulate these cards. So another example in the power environment uh, is the popper device. This is the devices that we have available in the IBM proprietary hypervisor, and we can emulate them in QMU as well. Right? Of course, this is quite slow. So the virtualization community in the past created what we call part of virtualized devices, which are devices that uh, have some knowledge about the fact that they are inside a guest. And because of that, they can leverage some advantages and uh, in, while communicating from you know, the guest to the host and vice versa. So uh, as they know they are in a guest, they have a shared memory with the host. Uh, they can exchange data more rapidly. They do not have to emulate all the details of a hardware, a real hardware, right? They, they know they are not real. So we have virtual devices, uh, which is uh, faster than emulation, but it's still, when you get to 100 gigabits or 200 gigabits device or NVMe disks, right, which are connected to the PCI bus, this is not enough. So uh, the, the, the kernel community, they created what we call virtual function I.O., right? Um, Virtual Function I.O. or VFIO uh, is a kernel driver that enables a device to be, let's say, disconnected from its driver in the host and connected directly to a, a process so that the process can control the device directly without interference from the, the host kernel, right? Uh, notice that although this is used in virtualization, this is not exclusive to virtualization, right? Um, Oh, again, man. Let me do something here. Turn off. Uh, so, VFIO. So, uh, VFIO is not exclusive to the to 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 virtual machines, right? You can use VFIO to connect a device to any process in the host or any process in the system, because it can be a virtual machine. So um, the advantage of doing that is that uh, you remove, let's say that you remove the kernel from, 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 from the, the I.O. processing, right? And you know, with that, uh, you can eliminate, for instance, uh, uh, exchange of data between user space and kernel space, right? Um, so there are a number of use for, for, for this kind of uh, technology. For instance, I mean, we have some network drivers in user space today, such as the PDK. I think OpenVSwitch uses this as well, in which uh, you transfer the network card directly to these uh, user space applications, and they will handle the data directly, right, without interference from the kernel. Uh, and with that, they are being able to uh, process data in a more flexible and faster way than when having the kernel in the middle, right? 
Um, but this is used in, in, in virtualization as well, because from the point of view of the host, the guest is just a process, right? So if you just use VFIO to attach a device directly to QMU process, um, that means you are just removing the host kernel from, 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 I mean, from, from the middle of the way, right? So you can, uh, QMU can access directly and control directly uh, the device, the I.O. device. And the advantage of doing that is that now you don't, ha you don't need the host kernel. I mean, as QMU is actually running a, a kernel inside the guest, it's the guest kernel that is controlling directly the device, okay? Uh, this is available in many platforms. I mean, VFIO is, of course, not uh, platform independent. You depend on some features of the processor. Uh, specifically, you need IOMMU uh, uh, support. Uh, on x86, this is available, but you have to enable a kernel command line parameter, IO, Intel IOMMU equals on. Uh, on power machines, this is available uh, by default, so you don't need to do anything to exploit this feature, since power 8, at least. Um, so, how does that work? I mean, how can you pass through a device to a guest, right? Or to any process, but you know, the examples that I will give uh, is, of course, focused on virtualization. Uh, this is the list of PCI devices that I have on this laptop, right? So, a bunch of them, right? Um, in the tests that I run, I try to pass through the uh, network adapters. So, I have two network adapters. I have this Ethernet controller here, right? And I have a wireless um, here, wireless card, okay? Uh, so I did two tests. I, I, I passed through the Ethernet card to guest, and then I passed through the wireless card to guest. Um, so LSPCI, it will list all the PCI devices on the system. And of course, that you need to know that, because I need to know the PCI ID uh, of the device in this system. Um, to identify it when passing through it to, to, to the guest, right? That's, that's the, the reference that we use. So, when you start your system, usually the kernel probes for all the devices, right? And it will try to um, init a module for, to control that device when it's available, right? That's the usual behavior. So, when I turn off my laptop, the Ethernet card and the wireless card, they will be owned by the host kernel, right? So if I want to pass it through a guest, uh, I need to unbind them from the, their drivers. So there is a way uh, to disconnect the module from that device. Uh, and the way you have to do that, I mean, sorry, first of all, I mean, the devices are divided in, in the PCI topology, in the PCI Express topology, the devices are divided in IOMMU groups, right? So remember that I said that you have to have IOMMU support in order to support PCI pass-through. Uh, and the devices are organized in a way that many of them can be in the same IOMMU group. This simply specifies that um, all these devices, they share a common control uh, area in the PCI address range, right? Uh, some devices, they are alone in their IOMMU group, such as my wireless card, but some other devices, they are not alone. I mean, if you take a look on the Ethernet card, there are many other devices on the same uh, IOMMU group, right? And that's interesting because I was not aware of that. And if you take a look here, I mean, all the devices with 1F, uh, they are in the same IOMMU group, right? So. That was quite interesting because when I say, I mean, the network card is alone and there is a, the slot number here, three, uh, and there is no other uh, card in the same slot. I mean, that doesn't mean that the, all the devices in the same slot, one, I mean, zero, are in the same IOMMU group, right? I mean, there are others like uh, devices in the same slot that are not in the same IOMMU group. Uh, but no, in this case specifically, all the devices with 1F are in the same IOMMU group. And if you take a look, I mean, there is an ISA bridge, which is a bridge for that no old uh, standard that is still available on this machine. Uh, memory controller, an audio device, an SM bus, and the Ethernet controller. So you know, I, found, I found that quite interesting because what probably happens here is that all these devices, they have been put together in a chip in the motherboard. Right? Back again, I don't know, 20 years ago, probably. <laughs> and they are still doing the same chipset until today. Even though we have a 1,000 gigabit Ethernet card in this case, 
they are you know, all probably in the same chipset, in the motherboard, and that's why they share the same I.O. and M.U. group. So when you are passing through a device, you cannot pass through only one of the devices to the guest or to the process, because if you do that, you can compromise the security, because all these devices will share the same PCI address space. Right? So you have to pass through all the devices in the same I.O. and M.U. group to the guest. And the interesting thing is that if you do that, I mean, you have to pass through all these devices. So if you pass through the Ethernet controller, you lost the audio device in the host as well, right? Uh, in this specific case, of course. Uh, so when doing that, you have to unbind uh, all the devices in the same I.O. memory group from their drivers so that you can pass through them to the guest. Uh, here's a short script created by one of the guys that work in my team, uh, Ziviani, uh, that shows how to do that, right? So basically what he does is he mod probe the VFIO driver. Uh, he looks for the device that you pass in the command line of the script. Uh, then he finds all the other devices in the same IO memory group. And for each of them, he do a driver override on that device for VFIO right, and bind the device to VFIO. So this unbinds the device from, their, from its uh, previous driver and bind it to the, new, to the VFIO driver, right? And you do that for all the devices in the same IO MMU group. And after doing that, the device is now attached to the VFIO driver, not to its uh, you know, uh, previous driver anymore. And because of that, I mean, you can just uh, assign it to a process, right? In this case, I mean, we are going to start key remove. We are going to start a virtual machine, and we will define uh, some devices of the type VFIO, right? Uh, the ID is something that we can uh, create uh, arbitrarily. But you, ha you have to point the, uh, the host uh, device as well, right? And with that, we pass through the device uh, to the guest. When the guest starts, it will be able to see these four devices. In this case, I was passing through the Ethernet adapter, so I have to pass through all the IO MMU group uh, uh, at the same time, right? And uh, so that, that's the way we do that with QMU, right? I mean, it's, it's quite hard because you have to unbind each uh, device from, from the host and then specify each of them in the command line. And you know, this can be tricky. You can forget something. So libvirt has support for this as well. Right? In libvirt, you just have to specify a piece of XML saying uh, that you have you know, um, a host dev uh, device, a host device, uh, and you put manage equal yes. And libvirt will handle all these uh, 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 all that that script does, right? So it will unbind the device from the host driver, it will bind it to VFIO, and it will create a virtual machine with the device uh, directly attached to it, right? And again, here, I mean, you have to define the source, which is basically the address, uh, I mean, the, the PCI uh, slot ID uh, of the, the host device that you want to pass through, right? And Libvirt will handle everything automatically for you. So. If I do that from my Ethernet adapter, right, uh, this is what I see inside the guest. When I do LSPCI uh, inside, no, sorry, this is the same thing that I put before in the host. Uh, no, sorry, this is the guest, yeah. I know this is the guest because we have the USB QMU controller here. So, <laughs> uh, so when I pass through the, uh, the Ethernet card, I mean, if you go back here, uh, I have the IOA MMU group with all the uh, uh, five devices, one, two, three, five devices, right? Uh, I have to pass all of them to the guest. And if I do that correctly using Libvirt, which was what I did here, uh, all of them will be available uh, somewhere here. So here it is. I mean, the ISA bridge, the SM bus, the Ethernet controller, right? The audio device. So. It's interesting because you can see that they are not mapped the same way that they were in the host, right? So we created a completely new abstraction, which are you know, virtual uh, PCI slots, and the devices uh, can appear in the guest. I mean, these are, this is arbitrary. This is uh, Q, uh, emulated by QMU, I mean, where the device is connected. But you know, these are the same host devices appearing in the guest, OK? 
Uh, when I do the same for the wireless adapter, I mean, it's a little bit simpler because as uh, we saw before, I mean, the wireless adapter is connected, uh, is alone in the IOMMU group, right? So we need to pass through only that uh, to, to the guest. So uh, here it is, I mean, the network adapter, right? And in this case, uh, I was doing uh, a test with an emulated network card. So if you see here, I have an Ethernet controller, right, which is an E1000 uh, network controller. So this is, this is emulated, although it appears here as an Intel Corporation network card. I mean, this is an emulated card. I was not passing through. I don't have this device on, on my laptop. This is the device that I'm passing through. OK? So I run some tests but just for fun, right? And I put a huge disclaimer here because you know, I, at IBM, everybody's afraid when someone starts talking about performance numbers. So this, is, this was just for fun. Uh, and I was trying to prove, you know, let's see if that's really valuable, right? I mean, I said to you that PCI press through can improve performance, right? But, you know, usually uh, we are concerned about that we en when we're running, you know, uh, network cards with, you know, gigabits per second and, uh, I don't know, you know, any v very fast NVMe devices or, you know, PCI devices that really use a lot of bandwidth or that, that has a very low latency. And that's not exactly this, the case with my laptop, right? So I was just running some tests to see if I could, if I could, uh, see any difference when passing through devices on my laptop. And you can see here that when doing a very simple latency test, and this is very simple indeed, I mean, I was just pinging the machine and looking at the average numbers, right? Uh, and I plot all the ping, the ping latency results here on this graph for each uh, device. So if I am using the Ethernet card, the host uh, has a very low latency. I mean, this is between my machine and the network attached storage that I have at home. Um, and if I pass through the guest, uh, if I pass through the device to the guest, I have a similar latency, right? But when using Virtual.io, which is part of Virtualized, the latency is uh, you know, considerably uh, larger. And if I use an emulated E1000 device, it's even bigger, right? Now, if I do the same test with the... So this proves that PCI pass-through is good, right? I mean, the latency was... Uh, very similar to, to the one in the host, right? Very little overhead. If I do the same test with the wireless card, however, <laughs> I didn't get so, you know, the same kind of results. Uh, so the latency in the host uh, was, of course, bigger than when using the cable. Uh, and the latency using pass-through is not that different from the latency in the host, right? But I was able to see that Virtio also has a similar latency and, you know, uh, and emulated device has even a, a, a smaller latency, and I said, no, this is, this is not right. I mean, this can be possible. And then I started to look at the results of the, of the commands that I sent, and what happened here was actually that I was having uh, a huge loss of packages when using the emulated device backed by the wireless card, right? So that's probably because, the, I mean, I wasn't comparing apples to apples, right? I mean, I was losing packages, so it was probably worse if I was accounting for the amount of data that I was able to transfer. Um, but then, I mean, uh, Virtio probably has some, uh, Virtio usually has a good performance, right? And in this case, as the, the latency of the wireless card is quite larger when compared to, to the cable, the Ethernet uh, uh, device, um, uh, it seems that Virtio can keep up with the, the performance that we can have from the, the the wireless card in this case, right? Uh, then I tried to do some tests with Fiperf uh, as well. I mean, to uh, trying to, to 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 measure the bandwidth, right? Not only the latency. And when we do when we do that, I mean, this was really a simple test. I mean, I'm not an Iperf specialist. I just run Iperf with the standard values and 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 got the results, right? Um, so I was able to reach uh, 900 uh, megabits per second. So my network adapter is a gigabit one. So you know almost the nominal uh, value, right, of the of the, the network card. And I got 800 gig gigabits with pass through. So that is actually a good result, right? Uh, I mean, a uh, little bit more than 10 percent of loss, right? That that's that's what I would usually expect from virtualization. 
But it seems that Virtue.io is smart enough to use some caches that it can reach almost the same bandwidth that uh, I have uh, in, in my network adapter, right? But again, I mean, this is true for my gigabit adapter. Uh, I have some tests internally at IBM, but I was not able to reproduce them for this talk. But I remember that we run some tests in, you know, some years ago that with a 100 gigabit network, this is not true. Right? Because uh, with a 100 gigabit network, you will have something like 10% loss when passing through. But Rich.io is not able to keep up with you know, 90 gigabits per second bandwidth, right? Uh, although it's really smart. I mean, and if you go I mean, to emulation, then uh, you really lost uh, quite a bunch, right? So you have six, uh, 650 uh, megabits per second. Uh, and I did the same for the wireless adapter. So uh, again, the wireless adapter seems to lose some packages, so the bandwidth would be uh, smaller, right? So it's interesting to see that passing through or virtual.io is almost equal to the host as well. Right? And emulating the device is uh, not so good. So what I was able to prove to myself, at least on my laptop, was that you know, PCI pass-through was extremely good for latency. Not so, I mean, it was good for, for bandwidth, but Virtio was able to keep up, right? Uh, but I can reassure to you, I mean, if you are running uh, PCI devices that requires more bandwidth, not even Virtio will be able to, to keep up with, with, with the performance, right? Uh, then I got some numbers from uh, some guys at IBM that are testing NVMe pass-through, right? And I don't know the details about the test because they were a little bit, you no, know, they are from the performance team. They said, oh, I cannot say what I'm doing exactly, so you cannot show them. Okay, it's just to you know, show some reference, right? So they are running a, a bunch of uh, FIO tests in a host and in a guest, and the, it's the same NVMe device. So they just pass through the NVMe device to the guest. And you can take a look, I mean, if you take a look at the graphs, I mean, they are quite similar, especially for the largest uh, uh, writes, one megabyte and 16 megabytes, right? Uh, so with bigger writes, the performance is uh, almost the same in both graphs, right? So even though you are passing through an NVMe device, which is extremely fast to the guest, you are not seeing any difference in performance in this case. For the smaller packages, uh, 4K especially, they are seeing some bad numbers when passed through, and they were not understanding. And I said, well, we can analyze that afterwards. But yeah, that, that's strange, right? Uh, we shouldn't have this difference in performance when passing through with 4K as well. So that's, uh, that's the actual stage of the, what they are working on, right? Um, but at least, I mean, uh, I was uh, very pleased to see that for large packages, I mean, the performance is the same, right? So, is it worth it? I mean, uh, if we pass through, we can have lower latency, we can have higher bandwidth, but we have a limited number of physical adapters as well. And every time you pass through an adapter, you lose it from the host, and you cannot share it with other devices, right? And you cannot do live migration as well, because in order to migrate a VM to another host, you have to migrate the state of the VM, and you cannot migrate the state of the device. Right? There's no way to do that. So the special interested group that, uh, that directs the PCI standard, they created another specification that is called single root IO virtualization, which is basically a way to virtualize a physical device into many virtual functions. Right? And uh, each virtual function acts more or less as an independent uh, PCI device. And with that, I mean, all the isolation between the virtual device is done by the hardware, the adapter itself, and you can pass through only the virtual function to a guest, right? So uh, I have an example here from uh, a machine that we have at IBM. This is a power machine with a uh, Mellanox network card, Connect X5, that is able to do SROV. So you have what we call physical functions. This is actually the, the physical port in the device, right? And you, we can virtualize them. And we have many virtual functions in this case. I think it was 128 or something like that, right? So that means we can uh, pass that same network card uh, more than 100 times to, to, to guests, right? So it can be to different guests or to the same guests, right? And the interesting thing is that you know, we can pass through each individual virtual function to a guest. So they, are, they have their own IO and memory groups as well. Right? This is controlled by the hardware itself. Uh, there is also another standard that uh, is 
not that uh, much, uh, I mean, uh, popularized yet, which is multi-root I.O. virtualization. So for a single root, you have one PCI card and multiple virtual functions, but this PCI card is connected to a computer. In the multi-root uh, case, you have a PCI card that can be used by multiple hosts at the same time, right? So you have something like this. So you have a multi-root I.O. virtualization switch, right? And all the hosts can use uh, virtual functions provided by this switch, and you can pass through them to the guest directly. Right? You don't have to have the device connected to a machine. As the same device can be used by many machines at the same time. Right? Uh, Amazon has, or at least I, I read on the internet that they had uh, these uh, in their new um, uh, bare metal environment that uses KVM to partition the device. So it seems that they developed some kind of uh, MRROV devices to connect to different bare metal instances at the same time. Um, the IBM mainframes have something, something similar to this as well, uh, because in the mainframe you can partition the machine in multiple uh, hosts, uh, and you can share the same adapter in between multiple hosts, but it, it, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not compliant with the standards as far as I know. I mean, it's something that was created uh, or, you know, many years ago uh, by IBM. But it's more or less the same idea. So, but this is a standard, and I think that at least for cloud environments, this will start to gain more traction in the future, right? Because you probably don't, don't want to have, and you don't need to have the hardware connected to each device. You can have you know, a top of rack switch uh, that can provide network functions for everybody, right? Um, so, and live migration. So, if you are, as I said, I mean, you cannot uh, migrate the state of the device, right? But there are ways to use, uh, you know, some other, um, uh, uh, you know, technologies developed in the Linux kernel, such as MacVTAP device. And, you know, MacVTAP is just a layer that you create uh, a virtual, uh, a virtual network card uh, that maps to something that is below it. So you have, you can connect a virtual function directly to a MacVTAP device, and the guest will be able to use this MacVTAP device, but in reality, it's just mapping to the virtual function being passed through. Um, in this case, you are able to migrate the VM. If you have the same network card in, in, in the destination host, uh, you can do the migration, and what it will do is to create a MacVTAP device on the, on the destination and pass through one of the virtual functions to that uh, exactly same, uh, to that MacVTAP, and when you migrate it, we will migrate the state of the MacVTAP device, and you can continue to use this as if it was a pass-through device. I mean, it's not really just pass-through because there is an additional layer here, which is the MacVTAP interface, but uh, the performance is usually better than using, you know, emulated device or even Virtio in this case, right? And you are able to migrate. I mean, um, but I can, I, I mean, I can say that, you know, the community is looking for ways to do migration without MacVTAP at all. I mean, using SROV directly, right? Or Vitor functions connected, you know, pass through devices, right? Um, let's see. I mean, I think this will be solved soon. <laughs> Right. What about GPUs? I mean, I talked about, you know, uh, a number of different uh, buses being uh, created recently because of, uh, you know, GPUs and other uh, devices that require uh, more bandwidth, right, or more data to be transferred. Um, uh, this gets a little bit tricky, I mean, because uh, these new buses, they are not PCI, right? So, but, you know, fortunately, uh, what the community is doing is that even though they are not uh, PCI buses, they usually appear as a PCI device <laughs> for the host, right? So if you do an NLS PCI, you will see the NVLink devices, for instance, listed at, as PCI device. So this is just an abstraction, right? And because of that, you can just pass through these devices to the guest as well because they are using the same, kind of, the same abstraction as a PCI device, even though the underlying bus is different, right? Uh, so, this, this was good enough before, but now, I mean, if you take a look uh, on, on the new buses that are appearing, such as Anivlink 2, uh, Anivlink 2 not only provides a faster bus, but it also provides memory coherency between the I.O. device, uh, and, sorry, between the memory in the I.O. device and the memory in, in, in the system, the main memory, right? Uh, which means that if you are using data in the device and the data changes, if that data is cached in, in, in the processor, it will, the cache will be invalidated as well, right? Even though the data is in, is in the device. 
Uh, and when you are uh, trying to pass through such devices, I mean, this gets a little bit more complicated because now you don't only need to handle uh, the PCI device to the guest, but you also need to isolate this memory coherence protocol so that it only affects the memory that is cached for that specific guest, not the, you know, not the memory uh, used by the host or the other guests, right? Uh, but we were able to uh, do that, and you know, support for anything to pass through is available uh, in, in the kernel uh, now, uh, and you are able to pass through the device and continue to use this memory coherence uh, uh, feature in the guest. Uh, and the interesting part is that as anything to appears as a PCI bus as well, we were able to hide all these details, and you can just pass through the NVLink2 uh, device to the guest, and it will work with the memory coherence and everything. But you know. Uh, as if it was a simple PCI device, even though it, it's not, right? And that's it. I mean, uh, I tried to you know, show you a little bit about you know, uh, how PCI pass-through works and uh, what are the advantages. Uh, any questions? Sorry? We don't have time for questions. No questions? I will be here. Uh, will be around yep. in the conference hall. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you.